Power to the people. All the uh, POP members, come come up, please, if you can. Unless you absolutely have to sit down. But if you don't have to sit down at this moment, come up. Come around. Yes. Yes. Come around. Come on up. They come. They come. I'm so glad to see Councilman. John Sharp James here. Give him a big hand. So glad to see him here. And our youngest elected school board member in the history of Newark, Marquise Lewis. Give him a big hand. Power to the people. Power to the people. Once again, we gather today on the, I believe, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, what would be the 47th anniversary of the Newark Rebellion. This would be the 33rd commemoration that the People's Organization for Progress has held of the Newark Rebellion. Our organization was founded in 1983 and every year since the founding of our organization we have commemorated the Newark Rebellion. We commemorate this historical event because we believe it to be a benchmark in the black liberation struggle. It is a critical event in the historic, historical, political, social, and economic development of the city of Newark. We trace our tradition, our roots of the People's Organization for Progress to the black liberation struggle, to black people's struggle for freedom, justice, and equality, and to our resistance movement against all forms of racial oppression. Many of us in POP were eyewitnesses to the rebellion of 1967. And it was a transfiguring event in our personal development. Many of us were, like so many others at that time, not aware of all the social and economic and political issues of the day. But if you lived in Newark, New Jersey, you could not escape the impact of the rebellion of 1967. And if you didn't have any discussions in your family of the issue of race, up until that point, that became the nodal point to ask questions. And many of us, I know I was 12 years old in the summer of 1967, I was one who began to ask questions. And just like many others who are here today and who you will hear from today. But we remember 1967. It was a catastrophic event in the city. And many people point to the, the destruction that occurred at that time. There was destruction, but if you only understand that part, then you don't understand the truth, because the truth is the whole. Because for as many negative impacts that event may have had, it had tenfold positive impacts. Today, we have a black mayor in the city of Newark his name is Ross Baraka. I believe that he would not be mayor today if it was not for the rebellion of 1967. Sharp James would not have been mayor today in his time if it wasn't for the rebellion of 1967. 
Kenneth A. Gibson, the first African-American mayor of a major East Coast city, would not have been mayor, would not have been the first African-American mayor if it had not been for the rebellion of 1967. Newark, prior to 1967, was an apartheid city. It was an apartheid city. It was a racially segregated city. It was a city that had a black majority, but was under the control of a white minority. And it took the manifestations of the civil rights struggle and the black liberation struggle in this city to change that. But it took really the uprising of 1967 to make that manifest. So what happened in 1967 changed the destiny of so many people in this city. And we're here today to observe what we believe to be one of the most important historical events in the history of the city of Newark, the 1967 Newark Rebellion. So to begin, we're going to have Tiffany. Tiffany is the granddaughter of Eloise Spellman, who is one of those that was murdered in 1967 and Tiffany is going to come and lay flowers then we're going to read the names of those on the monument. Come on Tiffany, give her a hand. Stay right there so they can get a picture. Put your hand on the flowers. Look forward so they can get a picture of you. This is the granddaughter of Eloise Spellman and her daughter is here also. And they come every year. They come every year. So now we'll read the inscription and names on this monument. This is a monument that was established uh, some years ago when George Branch was the councilman of the Central Ward of Newark. That's right, at the urging of the People's Organization for Progress and other groups and other individuals we said there needed to be a monument to those who perished in the rebellion of 1967. And as a result, uh, Councilman Branch initiated the effort and it was completed and um, of course ratified by the City Council of Newark. And this was obviously established in 1997 because it says commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Newark riot of 1967, we will forever remember the names of those whose lives were lost. And those names are Rose Abram, Elizabeth Artis, Tedek Bell, Leroy Boy, Rebecca Brown, Mary Helen Campbell, Presente. Rufus Council, Presente. William Fur, Hattie Gaynor, Presente. Raymond Gilmer, Presente. Isaac Harrison, Presente. Rufus Hawk, Presente. Oscar Hill, Presente. Jesse Mae Jones, Presente. Robert Martin, Presente. Albert Meisier, Captain Michael Moran, Eddie Moss, Cornelius Murray, Michael Pugh, James Rutledge, Victor Lewis Smith, James Sanders, Eloise Spellman, Richard Talaferro, Detective Fred Toto, dedicated by the residents of the city of Newark, July 11th, 1997. Let us now have a moment of silence for those persons who are inscribed on this monument and those whose names 
are not inscribed on the monument, who also perished in 1967. Moment of silence, please. Power to the people. Power to the people. Lift up a little bit. Lift up. Y'all pressing down hard on the back. Ease up. Ease up. Ease up. Ease up. Okay. All right. Brothers and sisters, thank you all for coming out today. As is our tradition, uh, we're going to ask those who's, who are relatives of those who perish, those that are present, who want to speak, to speak. We're going to give them a chance to speak. Then we'll let other folks who were eyewitnesses to what occurred in 1967 to speak and then we're also we're not just going to talk about the past Newark of the past we're also going to talk about Newark of the present and the challenges that face Newark today and we have um, other community leaders and representatives of other organizations and leaders of other campaigns around important issues in this city who are here. But let me just say as an introduction to those who are going to come in a minute that the uprising of 1967, why do we call it a rebellion? Many people refer to what happened in 1967 as a riot. The People's Organization for Progress and many others in the Black Liberation Movement, we do not refer to these uprisings as riots. Riots would have been uh, some disturbance that could have been managed and uh, dispatched by the local police in a short amount of time. What occurred in 1967 was one of 1,000 urban uprisings that occurred in the United States between 1960 and 1972. There was not one riot or two riots or one or two rebellions. There were 1,000 urban disturbances, urban uprisings in the United States between 1960 and 1972. In 1967, in that year alone, there were 148 urban uprisings. In the following year, 1968, the year that Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, there were 168 uprisings. And many people think that there was only the uprising here in Newark. If you go to Governor Hughes, a uh, special Blue Ribbon Commission report on civil disturbances in New Jersey, every major city, the 27 major cities in New Jersey had an uprising uh, beginning, not in 67, the first was in 1966 in Jersey City. So there were many uprisings and these uprisings were in response to racial oppression, the racial oppression that black people experienced all over this country, coast to coast. And more, I would venture to say, and this is a guess on my part, Zaid, but I would venture to say that 99% of them were sparked by incidents of police brutality. And this is what happened in Newark, New Jersey on July, on the night of July 12th, when Thomas Smith, a cab driver, uh, was stopped on Fairmont and Springfield where the new Cityplex movie theater is, that's on between Bergen and Fairmount. At Fairmount Avenue is when Thomas Smith was stopped by the police, was beaten by the police and taken uh, two blocks over to what was called then the 17th Avenue Precinct, which is now called the West District Precinct. And that precinct had a notorious reputation. Uh, many folks believed that Smith was actually going to be killed in that station. 
And there was a demonstration right there that night. Uh, and some of those who were in that demonstration are still alive and still with us today, such as Robert Kirvin. But there was a demonstration at the police station after they took Smith there. And as a result of the confrontation between the demonstrators and the police, the uprising, the rebellion in Newark started on July 12th, 1967. And if this had been a riot, it could have been easily taken care of by the 1,500 member Newark police force at that time. But they couldn't put it down. All the police in Newark couldn't put it down. They called in 700 state troopers. The 700 state troopers and the Newark police together couldn't put it down. So finally, Governor Hughes had to, to declare martial law. See, we know when we hear about military occupation in other places, we know about military occupation because we who were here in 1967 were under military occupation when Governor Hughes called in the National Guard. And they said initially that there were snipers that were killing people, but all the autopsies on these people showed that they were not killed by snipers. They were either killed by the police, the state troopers, or the National Guard. And that's in the book that this young lady, that Miss Spellman's uh, daughter is holding here, No Cause for Indictment by Ron Parambo, Nobody went to jail for the deaths of those people. But it was a cataclysmic occurrence, brothers and sisters. 3,000 people were arrested, 1,500 people were wounded, and 27 people were killed. And the uprising in Newark was followed by those in other cities, such as Plainfield, New Jersey, where folks actually got a hold of the armory and seized the armory. Nobody died in Plainfield. And then, and then after that, in August, the following month, was an uprising in Detroit that was so intense that they had to call in the 82nd Airborne. The same 82nd Airborne that was active in Vietnam, they had to call the 82nd Airborne into Detroit to put down the rebellion into Detroit in 1967. So this was a cataclysmic occurrence. And any of us that were living in the city at that time, we were, it was a transfiguring experience for us. And I'll talk later about my own personal experience, but I want you to hear now from uh, the family members of those who perished uh, in 1967. Let me, let me just say one other thing. Most of the uprisings, most of the rebellions that occurred in 67 were sparked by incidents of police brutality. But those incidents of police brutality were like the fuse on a ticking time bomb. It was the oppressive conditions that black people lived under that really were the, 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 the combined uh, uh, forces that actually brought about this rebellion. As I look out towards Springfield Avenue, my mind sees things that are not there anymore. I see Scudder Homes. I see Hayes Homes. Hayes Homes is right over here on West Kinney Street. I see Stella Wright Housing Project. In 1967, there were more black people per square mile in Newark than in any other community in the United States of New Jersey. We were compact into what is today called the Central Ward, what was then called the Third Ward. It was the old Third Ward. And through redlining and other discriminatory housing pra practices in Newark, most black people lived in the Third Ward of Newark at that time. But I just want to underscore the fact that it was the oppressive conditions, the substandard housing, the substandard schools, the unemployment, the poverty, these were the real causes of the rebellion, and the irony is that we still face many of these oppressive conditions today, brothers and sisters. So with that being said, I want to bring forward now Sister Spellman, the, the granddaughter of Eloise Spellman. Give her a big hand. They come every year, the whole family. Hi. My name is Pamela Spellman. I'm 
one of eleven. This is a picture of my mom. You know, they say that time heals all wounds. I'm sorry. Tom doesn't heal this wound. There's not a day in my life, and I'm 55, that goes by that I don't miss my mom. At the time that she was murdered, I was nine years old, but I remember everything. My mom was in a place her safe haven when she was brutally murdered, shot multiple times. Things that I did not know and that was kept from me, I found out by reading this book. My mom was two months pregnant when she was murdered. I did not know that. These are her grandkids, which is, these are my kids and my grandson. It hurts me to my heart. When her birthday come around, I cry. When Mother's Day come around, I cry. When I'm in tough situations, I cry. It's not a day that goes by that I don't miss my mom. This is my rock. As far as my healing process, Mother's Day came around years ago and I took one of my mom's picture and I blew it up as a gift to myself for Mother's Day. And when you walk in my house, this is the first face that you see. I had to take the anger that laid in my heart and put it aside. Because no one ever, ever did time for the crime, for the, the things that they did to my mom. Right. Right. Not only did they shoot her multiple times, I remember them coming up in the projects and forcefully disrespectfully having us come out the apartment and sit us in front of the nasty incinerator. Told us to sit there while they took their time getting my mom out of the house. They said if my mom had survived, she would have been a vegetable. My mom was shot multiple times, multiple. It had to be a machine gun. She was getting my sister out of the window getting her out of the window because she didn't want her to get hurt. Did you have the right to take my mom's life like an animal? And to this day, no one, they got away with murder. No one served time for my mother's murder. I have six siblings left. I know for a fact, if you guys remember my brother Michael, My brother Michael is not here today because he couldn't live with the death of my mom. And at the time that my brother was, my brother was 11 months old when my mother passed away. I lost another brother because of my mother's death, committed suicide. And he left a letter behind stating that he didn't have the memory of my mom's breast milk. You know, someone took her life, took her away from him. I lost two members of my family because of my mother's death. They did not get the chance to remember her. They did not get the chance to sit and smile and play with her. But like I said, it's not a day that goes by that I don't miss my mom. I miss my mother. And time does not heal all wounds. This here today, it's like July 15th when my mother was murdered, 1967. It bring back that sad memory. But I'm good. I'm doing well. I work. I have healthy kids that love me. I have a good family. I'm okay. And this lady right here came to me once in my life when I was being badly abused in a relationship. My mother appeared in my life, came into my bedroom and told me that she was watching over me. Apologized for scaring me. After she made her statement to let me know that she's here for me, my mother walked away. Never ever appeared again. So when I'm in tough situations along with God, 
I stand in front of my mom's picture and I tell her, Mom, I need your strength. I'm in a situation that I need help with. You made a promise to me that you'd be there for me. Help me get out of this. God is my witness. I wake up the next day and I'm good. I'm good. Because this lady right here is by my side. And I know one day we're going to meet again. Thank you so much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give another hand. Give another hand. Are there any other family members of relatives who are here? Any other, oh, excuse me, any other family members of those who were killed during the rebellion? Here and the other, there he is, Dave Armstrong, my main man. Give him a big hand. All right, all right. Glad you made it. Okay, glad to be here. Power to the people. Power to the people. Unfortunately, my mother, who's here every year, couldn't be here today because she's not feeling well. Her name is Anne Marie Penn. My aunt, her brother is actually Albert Messier, who also died during the riot. He actually was shot in the back. Um, while running away from the National Guards. I was about 10 years old at that time, and, and I knew him pretty well and stuff. I mean, he was only a couple of years older than me. He taught me to play basketball. He taught me about life. And he definitely was somebody that was missed because he was one of the male models of my family. I'm not a speaker. I just want to thank you guys for coming here. I want to thank Lawrence Ham for year after year. People choice for year after year and continue to struggle. Power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, he's, he's having uh, schedule some schedule constraints, so I'm going to ask uh, Councilman John Sharp James to speak. Give him a big hand. Power to the people. Power to the people. I just want to thank the People's Organization for Progress and Larry Ham for always remembering what's happened in our past. Uh, there's a saying that if you forget what happened in the past, you're bound to repeat it. We never want to repeat what happened in 1967. The positive thing that happened after this was a black and Latino convention in 1970. And that moved our political progress forward to the point where we could have our first African-American mayor here and continue with African-American mayors to move the city forward. So we need unity, we need remembrance, we need to respect those who sacrifice for our city. Never let them be forgotten. And let's always remember, united we stand, divided we fall. God bless you. Power to the people. Are there any other relatives of those who perished in 67 with us? You, you lost somebody, you perished? Any others who perished in 67? All right, at this point, I want to ask some of those who were alive in Newark at the time in 67 to give their regulars. Douglas Tucker, give him a hand. I was 13 years old. I live in the North Ward. We had an 8 o'clock curfew during the rebellion of 1967. And the National Guard was stationed at um, uh, Newark Stadium. So being a youngster, I climbed over the fence of the stadium and the National Guard pointed his rifle towards me, told me to get down or I will be a dead end. You know what N stands for. I got down, I ran home. I ran faster than Bob Hayes. Some of y'all remember Bob Hayes. I ran home, I stayed in the house till the next day. My father worked at Paps, the ribbon on South Orange Avenue and Grove Street. He got down off the bus and the National Guard said, get back on that bus. He got on the bus, he did not go to work for four days. He called in, he said, I got, 
a, a gun was pointed at me, I can't come to work. I got a lot more to say, but I'm not going to say anymore. But I'd like to thank everybody who's here for the commemoration of the 1967 rebellion. Thank you. Carter grew up in Scudder Holmes, Mercer Street. I just want to say in 1967, I was 12 years old, and I used to watch the war on television. But when you see tanks surrounding your buildings, the same tanks you saw in Vietnam, and they're aiming build, uh, they were aiming guns, sharpshooters, on the tops of Scudder Homes, aiming into our house. And my mother telling us to get down on the floor so we wouldn't get hurt and have the experience that these young ladies have had. But for the young people, recognize the reason why people rebelled is because they weren't sleeping. If you're sleeping, you don't even know what your condition is. And we're sleeping now. We didn't sleep. After you came up in Scuttle Homes up to 1972, we had a number of people who were still coming from the South, fleeing the Ku Klux Klan, sharecroppers. They didn't come that far to take anything. And so I remind all of you, never forget this day. If you know young people, talk to them. If you're a teacher, and I am, I teach at Essex County College, I infuse this in my classroom, every classroom, prison subcultures, corrections, American government, paralegals say there's no court that just students are in that this rebellion doesn't relate to. So make sure you tell the story. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask Richard Camareri. Richard? Richard Camareri, he was here in 67. Give him a hand. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I was here. I was, uh, I guess, 16 years old. I uh, lived on Bruce Street between Cabinet and 12th Avenue. Um, and it was uh, something out of uh, very surreal in some ways, although something that was to be expected as historians and scholars who live in Newark and research in Newark show. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time and it's uh, the one thing it always uh, does I try to be particular about in terms of historical analysis is that while there are 26 names on this stone, 24 people here were murdered. Um, not to, to uh, say the value of the lives of the, the two white gentlemen who died. Detective Toto had a heart attack and the uh, Captain Moran died under rather mysterious circumstances, most likely killed by a bullet from a National Guardsman or a state trooper. The other people, all black people, were murdered. They didn't lose their lives. They weren't mysteriously killed. It was murder. And unfortunately, no one ever was held to account, as the book by Ron Parambo clearly showed no cause for indictment. Um, you know, James Baldwin once said, the history is not merely the past. History is literally something that's with us every day of our lives. Um, in fact, even a gentleman named William Faulkner, a uh, interesting American white writer from the South, once said, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Um, we live the past every day, but it's not to, to be mired in it. It's to have it educate us. We learn from it, and we move forward. And in fact, Newark now represents the epitome of learning from the past with the election of a gentleman named Raz Baraka. Yes, yeah. Mayor Baraka, who would have, uh, here would have ever thought that uh, 47 years ago. In fact, his, uh, his father, uh, and it is too bad he could not be here to see this, but this may be the first time we've done this without a midi here or somewhere in spirit in the city which is um, in one way heartbreaking, but it's also inspiring that we have to live for him and move on. Um, we now have to work. We work to, to help Mayor Baraka, because this is a gentleman, a young man, who brings something as mayor of our city that we have never, ever had before. Right. He brings a level of experience and expertise and love for the city and authenticity as combined with intellect, as combined with being informed by his parents revolutionary zeal, and yeah, I use that word revolutionary because that's a proper word to use. Yes, right? yes, um, yes. We have a new day in Newark, a day that we have to work together to bring forward and push forward. Yes. Um, so we work, continue to work. There's obviously Demo, Mr. Ham here, and the People's Organization for Progress have been doing this for years and years. 
Uh, we work to make Newark a city that's worthy of its residents, a city that's humane, that's equitable, and that we can all feel good about being in. And maybe one day we won't have to work that hard, but we'll have to keep working no matter what. So again, I'm, I'm honored and always, always honored and humbled to be part of the program. Sorry I was late. But, uh, you know, the struggle continues. Thank you. Power to the people. Power to the people. I'm on. I'm on, as an MC, I'm going to use my prerogative. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I want to bring uh, our brother from the NAACP. He'll say his name. Uh, say a few words. Give him a hand. Newark NAACP. First, you have to give a hand to POP for spearheading this situation of Bobby every year because um, this, this should be much more crowded and it should be much more looked at in terms of all, all the people in Newark. Um, my name is Rick Robinson and I'm an executive member for the NAACP for Newark. Um, this is a teaching moment. We all, that, that horrific story that that young lady told, um, there are plenty of horrific stories to go along with that. So um, again, this is a teaching moment. You're young, your neighbor, family members, friends, anybody, they should be forwarding upward mobility just because of this situation here. So please, the NAACP believes in upward mobility and doing something about the past. Please, relate to your contact and do something positive about the past. Again, thank you very much and give it up for PLP. Power to the people. I would like to call forward a representative of the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition. Who? Beautiful Ciasia? Keisha? Keisha. Come on, Keisha. Come on with your red, black, and green. Come on, Keisha. All right. Are there any other eyewitnesses to 1967 while Keisha is coming? Come on, Forrest. Yeah, come on, come on, Pat. Pat, uh, Forrest, let Pat speak. Then you speak. Well, Brother Ham treat me like an old shoe. I should have dressed differently. We had Christmas in July then during the ride. So everybody was walking in the store, getting what they want. Rebellion, riot. It was free beer, free soda, television, furniture, whatever you want to see. But we have Christmas in July today, too, because of our new mate. That's another Christmas in July. Lord have mercy. I ain't seen no cops on the corner of Broad Market last night, 6, 7 o'clock. And they had taken over, made a precinct. I didn't mean to get up something. Behind you was the uh, Jump and Jive. Rich's Pawn Shop, Hamburger Joint, Beauty Parlor, Fish Sandwich was a dollar quarter. Close your eyes and smell fresh fish. I think a hot dog was 50 cents. The National Theater was on Belmont Avenue down there. I think it was 35 cents for me to get in. Malcolm X would visit the uh, mosque on South Orange Avenue. Frequently, I heard two. Uh, they were drug users, but they were well dressed, honored their parents. You could see your face in their shoes, handkerchief on their arm, a, a straw hat with a black band. They was dressed to kill. They was talking about whether they were going to hear Malcolm speak at this. I keep getting flashes of memory back and forth. I was 16 then. But this uh, street here, very sad and down. At least 200 people would be walking up and down. Some going to New York going to bars, dressed up, going to beauty parlors, shopping. It was more family orientated. No crack, mostly uh, uh, Valley High and uh, cheap wine with crushed ice and lemon. People sitting on the porch singing Dua. Uh, Temptations was alive and kicking in. James Brown, Temptations. You name all your hot groups, everybody was in one accord. This is even before Shaquille and Neil came over there on 234 Prince. All of these buildings, it was about three, four thousand people in this area. That's why they tore the apartment buildings down. And that's why Booker continued to move people to Section 8 Pennsylvania. Uh, 
now so he can lower the black boat and raise up the other boat on the other end, but we tricked him anyway, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, this, this uh, grave site is beautiful, but it would be like the Vietnam War if they showed the real site. The people who lost their dreams and uh, heartache, disappointments from jobs. That's why Miles Davis start turning around, I think, with his back to the people. Uh, Yusef Latif, how can you play and you, you don't have places to be heard or you paid less than the other person. So a lot of dreams, pieces of dreams died in other ways. Uh, then we had more, we had less of everything, but we had more humility, more pride, more self-esteem. Today, we have orange sneakers, orange fingernails, and you're going to this college, but we don't have any intelligence. We have education, but not intelligence. So please uh, cultivate your children around the like the Last Supper, the dinner table. That's where I learned at the table, talking to your parents, how was your day? If we don't have no kitchen table, forget about charter school. You got to have the table. Thank you very much. Hey, hey. All right. Before I call my, my fellow alumni from Arts High School, you know, I didn't do what I said I was gonna do the first thing I said I was going to do when I opened up the program today. How many people rode by this place two weeks ago? What did it look like two weeks ago? It looked terrible, didn't it? It looked nice today, don't it? Beautiful. Give Sandra Haywood a big hand. Come on, say something. Come on, Sandra. Come on. I said when I was coming down here that she would be the first person I would call, and I didn't do what I said I was going to do. But I hope you forgive me. Where'd she go? She's right there. She's coming. Mother of Rebellion Park. And the popcorn <laughs> Tell the people what you did. I'm so glad to see so many people here today. Um, it was my idea because I decided that our children need to be a part of this new north that we're having, being that we're having a new mayor who's gonna create a new renaissance for north. And all of my years of living here, there are a lot of people who do not know what this site is. I had a lot of reservations last night about leaving the flowers here, but you know, I went home last night and I prayed, I'm like, these flowers are gonna be here when I get back here tomorrow. And the neighborhood people are going to make sure that this park <coughs> stay clean. And this part right here, I really feel that this should be a landmark. But them feeling Sonic over there, and I think shop right there, I figure sooner or later they're going to come over here and try to move this monument. Uh. So I figure if I adopt this piece of land, beautify it, that when they come over here to mess with it, Everybody is going to rise up. This is the spot where the rebellion started. This is the part of North that's going to stay. This tree right here could not be moved because the roots run into 15th Avenue. And this tree is going to represent the struggle of our people, that our roots are here and this planet solid, and we're here and we're not going anywhere. Thank you. Sandra Haywood. She is, listen, she is also the organizer of the youth wing of P.O.P., the Popcorn Kids, which have Black History Month program every month for the past 12 months. Popcorn Kids. Now my alumni, Forrest Drennan, give him a hand. He was here in 1967. Hello. My name is Forrest Drennan, as you were told, and uh, I lived in 1967 on Hudson Street here in Newark, uh, on the border of what was then the North Ward and the Central Ward. And uh, we, my, fa my family had a three-family house in which all of the African Americans on that block lived. Everyone else was Italian, everyone else was Irish. We, uh, uh, and uh, when they called out the National Guard, the National Guard came with two Jeeps, deposited some uh, um, um, 
some troops out in front of our house, had one soldier on our front porch to search us as we went in and came out. My family was not a radical family. We were brought up to respect the uh, culture of the dominant people here. But 67 sort of changed my, my, my mind a little bit. <laughs> my oldest brother was a concert violinist. He did a concert during the riots. He came home from the concert and they searched his violin case. And he objected to the way they handled his violin, which was his prized possession. And, and they threatened to, to bayonet him. So um, I remember a lot about the Newark riots, even though I was a little bit out of the zone here where the, most of the rioting occurred. I still remember it. Thank you. Mars, Drennan, my fellow alumni from Arts High School. Where's Sister Keisha from the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition? Come on, give her a hand. And she's coming up with beautiful C.A. Natasha, no, okay. I, I'm gonna get it right. Peace family. Sister Natasha of the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition. So we'd like to thank Pop for the work that you guys have always done. Um, you know, we, I wasn't born in 67, but I do remember as a young girl in the 70s um, going to the mosque up the street on Springfield Avenue, as well as having to travel to Springfield Avenue Community School. And I remember this area always, you know, being abandoned and run down. And I asked about it because there was such a strong feeling, a strong presence. And although I wasn't born years later, those spirits still were here. And I remember inquiring about it and they, you know, at the time they said it was a riot. And riot didn't, as a child, riot didn't feel good. Rebellion now I understand. And so when people got tired and they had to make their uh, voices be heard, you know, drastic measures had to be taken. So, um, you know, we just appreciate, you know, being invited to be here, you know, understanding and still learning our history as young adults. And, um, you know, just grateful to be alive, to have followed in the footsteps of such honorary people. Peace. Thank you. All right. Give Natasha a hand. Natasha and Sister Keisha from the Newark Anti-Violence Coalition. We got some more Newark residents that want to say a word. Come on. Say your name. That's right, Cynthia. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Cynthia One Day Flood. And I was here in 67. I was 12, about to be 13. Actually, all this stopped my birthday party. Um, but what I really wanted to say was, this site that Drew all are standing on right now was the site of the Black Panther Party office. Right across the street in that apartment building over there was the Amiri Baraka bookstore. And we traveled this street, this strip right here, every single day. Okay, the young lady just made a very powerful point. There are spirits here at this point, and they are going to continue to be here. And I want to thank this young lady right here because they shouldn't, no one should take this spot at all. Thank you. Peace be unto you. Peace. My name is Hafiz Farid, and I'm a Newark native. My family goes back in Newark over four generations. So I was definitely here before 67 and, and 67. I was 14 years old. Wow. I think it's very important to also point out the context in which the rebellions took place. This was a city that was in the vice grip of the mafia. One of the most powerful, or some of the most powerful mobsters in the United States of America hailed right here from Newark, New Jersey. And because it was much smaller than Chicago and New York, it was easier to take hold of the city and control it lock, stock, and barrel. I'm talking about from the mayor all the way down to the policeman on the beat. This street was controlled by the mafia. And so this rebellion was a rebellion that was seething and bursting every day. It was a powder keg, and we all knew it could have happened at any point. And the cab driver was just the, the, the brutality against the cab driver was just the straw that broke the camel's back. So I think it's important to understand the context 
uh, of a city that was in the vice grip of criminals, not just white domin political domination, but a criminal mafia domination that had begun the war on black people and brown people in terms of infusing drugs. At that time, it was a heroin. The H-bomb was dropped on North New Jersey. And in the post-rebellion, after 1967, it was escalated with the complicity of the government, and then it was uh, kept in the African-American community, which is why you can go to the North Ward, why you can go to Forest Hill and see some of the most beautiful homes that were unscathed by the scourges of drugs. And lastly, it is important to recognize that we have never been able to tell this story except for the efforts of Larry Ham and the people of Pop. And we, we have to applaud them and we thank God that the brother pulled through from his accident and because God knows we need him. This was a people's rebellion. This rebellion did not stop in, at start at City Hall. We're very thankful that we have uh, elected African Americans, but the people did this rebellion. It didn't stop. It didn't start in City Hall. It started in the streets. And I think it's very important to, to really say in, in, in ending that the story has never been told from our standpoint, from the standpoint of the oppressed. There, there has been a documentary made, but it wasn't our documentary. To have Amiri Baraka, a world-renowned, internationally known poet, playwright, essayist, writer, to have him in the city and never give him the resources to make this film, to make this play, is a shame and a disgrace, not against white people, but against our own people, that that brother lived here and died here and was never given the opportunity to tell this story. Who could have told it better? He could have written it in his blood, his sweat, and his tears. And so now that we have new political leadership and, and the son of Amiri Baraka, I pray that one day that money and resources be put in place so this story can be told in truth by the right people and defined by ourselves just as we're defining it as a rebellion and not a riot. Thank you very much. All right. I got some more Newark residents and cultural workers, but I'm gonna I'm interrupt. Just give me one, give me one little, little minute here. We got some young brothers here from the American Civil Liberties Union. I want them to come forward. Give them a hand. They're here today to represent the ACLU. There was a big, big article in the paper today. One of the issues the ACLU is working on is bail reform. You know that bail works against poor people. They said you $2,500 bail, you not coming out. So they trying to rework the system so it don't work against poor people. Go ahead, brother, introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rashawn Davis. I'm at the ACLU. Um, I'm, it, I wasn't alive in 1967, but I tell you, it's powerful to be here today. It's really powerful to see this honoring of our history. Um, and I remember growing up, my mom and my grandmother, who were lifelong Norkers, used to tell me about the riots and everything that happened and just the power and the struggle and how far we've come as a city and as a people. Um, and I tell you that I'm honored and I'm proud to be here today. Um, and even at the American Civil Liberties Union, I'm proud to work there. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we trumpet uh, is the fact that we were here in 67. The ACLU were housing people who were running um, from the National Guard who were afraid to go home. They came to the ACLU and they stayed. And even in 1967, after the riots, it was the American Civil Liberties Union who was first calling for a federal monitor to come in here and reform North Police Department so that our people can have more rights. We were the first to call for a civilian complaint review board so that the people uh, can have the right to, to set the direction of our police department. And as Brother Ham was saying earlier, you know, 47 years later, almost 50 years later, we're still dealing with some of the same problems that were brewing in 67. So our work is, is far from done. It's far from done. Brother Ham was saying we had a piece in the Star Ledger about stop and frisk. We're working on bail reform. There's so much work to be done in this city. We're working hard, um, and, and, and we should use this history. History is still present today. We should use what happened in 67 as fuel to keep going, to perfect our city, to perfect our people, and keep moving. So thank you. You know, this is, this is powerful to be here right now, and God bless. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Give him a hand. Give that young man a hand. It's a future leadership. Ross Baraka was that age at one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
<laughs> Larry Ham was that age. <laughs> that's right. You see that picture that Marquise Lewis is holding? That's a picture of Amiri Baraka in 1967. You see that white spot on the picture? That's actually a picture. That's actually a bandage that was on his head. The police tried to kill, tried to beat Amiri Baraka to death in 1967. They beat him bloody and threw him on the floor of police director Spina's office like he was some kind of, 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 of refuse, you know. But uh, they thought they had did him in and he just came back stronger and got the first black mayor elected in Newark. <laughs> Three years later, people were talking about what happened. You know, it's important to remember in 19, in July of 1967, the rebellion occurred. The rebellion occurred, and but literally two weeks after the rebellion, a Black Power conference was held in North. Two weeks after, two weeks after, a Black Power conference was held downtown North. If you look over here, you see West Kinney Junior High School. That's where the Black Power Convention of 1968 was held. At West Kinney Junior High School, and further up, you can't see it from here, but further up on Clinton Place, is it, is it called University High now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. University High, it was called Clinton Place Junior High School then. That's where the Black and Puerto Rican Convention was held in 1969 which led to the election of Mayor Gibson as Mayor, Sharp James, as Councilman of South Ward, Dennis Westbrooks, as, um, uh, did I say Dennis Westbrooks? Central Ward, um, and, and others. So now we're gonna hear from Sister Roundtree. Give her a big hand, Minister Roundtree. God bless you, God bless you. Well, I, I first wanna give honor to God. I have to do that whenever I come before the people. and. It's an honor. It is truly an honor to stand here today. During the rebellion, I lived right down the hill on the corner of Court and High Street in the Kruger Mansion. And during that period, when all of the disasters were occurring in this city, I was a little girl. I'm not going to tell you how little I was, and I'm not going to tell you how old I was, but I was alive. Alive enough to know that our history during that period that was being made was not a good thing. I stand here today honored to stand beside people like Larry, Laurie, um, Larry Ham and Barbara King and Marquise Lewis and William Morris and Pat Clark and Sister Natasha Allen. And if I start calling names, my time gonna be up. So I don't wanna continue to call, but all of you that have played a part. The biggest part we have to play now is sharing the history. We must share this history with our youth. Every opportunity that we get. We've all been guilty of it. We keep it amongst ourselves. We talk about it amongst ourselves. But the school system in the city of Newark, are our students aware other than what they read about in the newspaper or go to the library and see? The struggle has been going on so long. It didn't just start in 67. It escalated in 67. This neighborhood was destroyed. Thank God for the, the rising of a son. The raising of a son. The brother said that Amiri Baraka Sr. is not around to really have gotten the resources. It wasn't done in his time. Maybe that wasn't the time. Maybe now was the time because his son is the mayor. And since his son is the mayor, that means our time is not up. That means we still have time to get it done. So we can't just talk about it. We can't just be on corners about it. We have to be about it. And each one of us is responsible. I remember as a little girl, the Black Panther, my mother had a business right up the street. The organization, I remember Roger Smith, I don't remember his other name, but I remember them. I remember walking, they were watching our businesses. African-American businesses, that is. But in a lot of them. But as Sister Pat said, it was Christmas in July. And, and so my mama wouldn't let me come outside. Because I was like five or four or something like that. But yeah, I know, I know, I know. But, but I remember 
because I wanted to go outside and the kid, as children, it was, we were robbed during that period of so many things. So I just want to say, please, ma'am, please, sir, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, young people, if your parents don't share it with you, ask questions. Ask questions, because we have a job to do in this city, a major job. The mayor needs your help. The people need your help. And none of this is about me. None of it is about you. It's going to always be, if you're a servant, about the people. God bless you. Let's be there for the people. Power to the people. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Ham. Come on, Barbara King, who was in Amiri Baraka's organization. Give her a hand. Power to the people. I want to thank God and the ancestors for allowing Larry Ham to survive that car accident. We know we need to give it to him. Come on, no, we got to tell him to the shame the devil. Because this brother, he could have had so many other choices to do things in this, in this world, but he chose the people. I'm going to be brief, and I know Larry seems to think that's strange, but I'm really going to be brief and make a couple of points. I, was, I just graduated from high school in 1967. I live on 17th Avenue in the Hayes home across the street from the rebellion. I saw the life before the rebellion. A lot of us don't know, we walk around here today and don't know people paved the way for us to even live. They paved the way for us to work in stores, forget City Hall, forget the Board of Education. If it was one or two, you were lucky, people look like us. But overall, the stores, people, most of the people that control those didn't look like us, sort of like today. But this is what we saw every single day. We lived a life that we were on the bottom. I walked Springfield Avenue, going to school, going to Central High School. The life we lived was on the bottom. Also, living in the projects, we have to understand the effects it had on these people's lives in the rebellion. Not only I knew the Spellman family, but we used to go to the, on Springfield Avenue up here was a laundromat where the mother of 11 kids not only was shot and killed in her home because no one had regard for their family, but the effects it had on some of her children that I, that actually lived with me. Sharon, Bruce, I went to school with all these people that I know how their lives were. And like Larry talked about in that picture, when we talk about the Black Power Conference, we talking about Amiri Baraka, who was almost killed, but H. Rack Brown, Marlana Karinga, they all in here. People came from all over the country to fight. Now we're still fighting. We're fighting to live. And like Reverend um, Roundtree said, we have a mayor now. We have a mayor who wants to do the right thing. And like she also said, it's not just incumbent on him, it's incumbent on us. We have to continue to fight. He's not going to get in the office and things are going to turn around like that. There's going to be criticism. There are going to be people who are setting up things to destroy him. And if we let that happen, shame on us. On 17th Avenue as a kid, being a teenager, we didn't care. I saw the National Guard, the police, ride through my street on 17th Avenue with the shotguns out, pointed at kids. And we were so rebellious, we didn't know. We was like daring them. But we didn't know an eight-year-old boy had just got shot too. So all I will just want to say, end up by saying that this struggle continues. I was a teenager in 67, so you know I'm a senior now. And some people say you're still involved in this stuff. Wherever the fight is, in this city, as um, Marcus Garvey said, we can accomplish what we will. We have the strength. We have everything that we need to co control our destiny, to make this city better. And if we make this city better, we can make other urban cities better. And if we do that, we can make this country better. And if we do that, we can make a better world. Power to the people. <laughs> Bring that, bring that picture over here, the one Sandra has, so people can see that. Sandra, bring that picture over. This, for those who can't read the writing, uh, this is John Smith, 
on the right, that's the cab driver that was beaten by the Newark police. And that's the incident that sparked the rebellion. And this was a picture, uh, as you can see, this is from the um, cover of Life magazine. There was a poster made of this picture that was posted all around Newark, young boy that was shot and killed uh, by the police at that time. He survived, okay. All right, we're gonna have a little cultural presentation now. Come on. Hello, everybody. My name is Julissa McEachin. I'm a mentor for the Popcorn Kids. I'm also a new member of the People's Organization for Progress. And I'm also a poet. And I want to share two pieces with you today. The first piece that I'm going to share is a piece that I've recently written. And it's called Revolution. It's Revolution with a question mark. So it's Revolution. Freedom fighting ain't like it used to be. We no longer fight for rights, just for anything that's free. Like free parking, free before 12, and free giveaways. Nothing has changed but the times, which is the new form, the modern day slave. How can we coexist with greats when our values are poor? And though we say we don't judge, church's loyalty is measured by collection plates. Black people still argue over dark skin or light, and we think it's cute that these modern day children don't know wrong from right. They can't spell their names, but they can work iPads. And the world is filled with absent-minded mothers and stepdads. Dreams for adolescents to grow up playing basketball and such. What happened to the days of little girls with babes and beads playing double dutch? Everybody puts down on paper that they are part of the revolution. Until pens are dropped and it's time to suit up for execution. Parents are less excited about homework and more interested in kids twerking. And the lazy sit on their behinds while welfare is working. This generation knows nothing about picketing signs, but they'll give their dreams a chance and join picket lines. The lottery won't save your life when there's killings every day. The innocents are targeted by the violent getaway. Everybody wants to get rich, but know nothing about being wealthy. And while everyone is on this health phase, they make it so that the poor cannot afford to become healthy. Nothing is being done about poverty-stricken communities that exist within plain sight. We want our kids to dream, but hunger keeps them up at night. The young contemplate suicide because there is no outlet. They battle with homosexuality because while they want to tell the world, the words won't come out yet. Families work three jobs for bill deadlines they can't meet, while veterans fight for a country that makes it hard for them to get back up on their feet. Gun laws are too lenient, while weapons are still being concealed and funeral homes are making the killing off the of youth being killed. Ooh. The television ain't no different. Use your ignorance to block your view. <laughs> and while you're laughing at your future's legacy, millionaires are making millions off of you. Negroes saying spirituals like we shall overcome when dissected is more than just a song. Gil Scott Heron said that the revolution will not be televised, but TVs are still on. Thank you. And the last poem that I want to share is a poem that I, I, I do this poem frequently because every day that I turn on the news, there's always someone losing their life. And I'm actually tired of this poem being relevant. I can't wait for the day when I actually do this poem. And people are like, what are you talking about? Nobody's killing each other no more. But until that day, I'm going to continue to do this poem. And it's called Conscience. Conscience. Just as I saw another black person becoming the victim of gun violence. I wanted to scream out! But I was stuck in silence. Saying goodbye to a life so vibrant. The way people doing each other these days is nonsense. Cool it. Don't lose your temper and rage out in anger. That's your brother. But all you see is a stranger. I ain't God, so don't think I'm trying to change you. All I'm teaching is wisdom. You know, trying to save it. So all you want to do is sit on the corner and smoke your herb. Cause your word is your bond and your bond is your word. But forget that mess and forget what you heard. The way people going these days is making me sick. 
Don't you want to be higher than just another statistic? And when you're shooting up in the drugs, go to your brain? Mm. Take recollection of all the knowledge you drain. Be smart, use body, mind, and sound. Wait! Before you pull the trigger, put the gun down. Thank you. Give a hand, come on. Putting art in the service of the people. I want to ask, um, we haven't heard from the new Black Panther Party. Is there anybody from the new Black Panther Party? Oh, how did I guess? Brother Zaid Muhammad, give him a big hand. <laughs> oh, come on, y'all do better than that for that brother, Brother Zaid. Somebody who usually is here with us isn't. He meant a lot to us. A lot to us. I had these blown up for the 40th anniversary. Because we did a big thing because we wanted to highlight the organizing, the revolutionary organizing that came out of the Newark Rebellion and all the rebellions of that time. And just a, just a few words about these. And I'll, and I'll try to put this in a... In a Panther clips. We just lost a minute. We just lost our teacher, our leader, Aimamo. At that night, we gave him a stool that we had made, handmade in Ghana, a wisdom stool for the elders that he earned. That's a life award that we were able to give to him while he was here. And we need to learn how to do that. The same time that we were giving him that award, they were putting this man in solitary confinement. This is even now Imam Jamil Abdullah El Amin, the former A. Trap Brown. We just learned that after he had been denied proper access to urgent medical care while he was in the worst prison in this country, after having been framed by the government for a crime he didn't commit because they hated this man and hated him with the passion, and he is just one of dozens of political prisoners in this country from that struggle and from that time. He now has multiple myeloma, which is cancer of the blood plasma. And we are now in a life and death fight to get him out of prison on what's called a compassionate uh, uh, medical release so that he does not have to die uh, like a, a, a captured beast in the clutches of the state. So I want y'all to remember Imam Jamil. And, and I've had it on the People's Organization for Progress's uh, Facebook page, all the important updates around Imam. So y'all pay attention to that because we really need your help to try and save the imam's life. I'm responding to this as a panther and I want to talk about rebellion and what this set off. The Newark rebellion was huge and the impact and the exponential growth of the Black Panther Party. There were small chapters in the party back in 67, but on Wednesday, which would be the 16th of July, that's the birthday of Brother Smitty. How many of y'all remember Brother Smitty? Right? Brother Smitty was a combat veteran of the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And he had just finished his last tour of duty when the rebellion kicked off. They brought him out of the white man's army into the Black Panther Party. Huh? Marshal Eddie Conway just released after having done 42 years in prison for his involvement in the Baltimore chapter of the Black Panther Party, was on his way back from Vietnam in Europe when the rebellion jumped off. He said, I'm going back and I'm jumping in the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Then also, when the rebellion jumped off here in Newark, it set off 75 rebellions all around the country within days. I'm originally from Plainfield, New Jersey. The one that he talked about and died, nigga, died. 
Plainville, let me tell you something. It indeed was a little different. Then somebody made the mistake of having a weapons factory on the west end of Plainville, from the east end of Plainville. They, when the brothers got busy, they cleaned that weapon factory out. And the only casualty of the incident of police brutality in that rebellion was a pig named Gleason who tried to run down on some brothers by himself and they sent him right to hell, the only way you can go to hell when you're doing that kind of devil. The Plainfield Rebellion. In that rebellion, the casualties were on the other side. And that's the only rebellion that I don't understand why we're not talking about. But as a Panther, we got to raise up. When there are victories, no matter how remote or how small or how repressed or unknown, the people have to claim them because that is upon which we stand on. That's the foundation upon which we stand on. So for all those Panthers who are not here, many who are in prison still, many who are in exile, July 16th, it's also the birthday of Asada Shakur. We're doing a teaching to honor Asada and Smitty on the, on the 15th at our headquarters at Refab. We enjoy you. We urge y'all to come with us. But the thing is, is to understand is that that rebellion set off struggles, set off revolutionary. This is the evidence. And I had these young men up here for a reason. This is Tariq Tucker at the North Anti Violence and Hip Hop Association in Essex County, Dallas. You see these young men? The North Rebellion was the black man in the United States telling this white man, we are not afraid of you anymore. Y'all see that? That's Exhibit A. So I wanted this young man to understand that because he represents the next line of that courage. And he, but he's not just a representative of courage, he's a child of this struggle. And this is how to reach the box. Right? A young student of America. This is the reason why I had him on this picture. Because he knows what this represents. That's why he ran up the city council in Elgerton. And we want to see him win when that time comes and to continue to organize because he represents that next time. And then we got our daughter from the popcorn kids. Right? Yeah. You see the child? Which is one of the miracles of the New Rebellion is that that child survived. Yeah. He was raised. But see, you know, the white man is so sick. He took the picture. You think they would hurry up and got the child to the hospital, right? Yeah. Nothing but the mercy that created that child survived. He survived that. He got hit in the head, but he got grazed. Thank God. But that was the picture that survived that, that explains why a lot of the names on this monument are not just men, but are women and children. Huh? Women and children. Clement Price said, he won't say it out in public, but he'll say it off the record. The, the real story of the North Rebellion is that the people rebelled against oppression but it was the police and the occupying forces who rioted on right. oh, their uprising. That's, right. yeah. That's why the casualties are like that. But when you got some stuff of your own and all the bangers, I want y'all to hear me out here. If you're going to bang, if you're going to bang bangers, bang. Bang for freedom. We have history that we can claim. That at the right time, at the right place, we did indeed know how and when to bang, bang right. for freedom. And it changed the history because it didn't happen and go down in Plainfield the way it did in Newark and other cities because we did what we did when we had. And if we had what we had, we took out the streets now, why well, good night, all of those things would have been different. Long live the spirit of the North Rebellion. Long live the Imam, long live America Rock. Carry on the tradition, carry it all the way to freedom we see in the world. Brother Zaid and all of this help us today. We're going to hear from a couple of more speakers and we're going to march over to the West District Precinct and we're going to march back. It's only right over there. It's not a long walk. So don't get, don't leave. Don't run out of here now. It's only three blocks. But I'm going to ask Dow Scipio and Annette Austin to come up. We're going to hear from Dow Scipio first. We ask Dow to speak because he's trying to help people that live and work in Newark make a living wage. That's important. Give them a big hand. Now, sit down. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. My name is Darrell Scipio. I'm here to represent SCIU 32BJ. 
SEIU 32BJ just celebrated 80 years of organizing workers. We organize workers because there's been a very long history of income inequality in this country. Income inequality where a few people get all the money, all the resources, while the masses have to share crumbs. We think that that's unfair, that that's unjust. I personally think that economic justice is the last frontier for our people to conquer. So that's why I do this work. Right now, we, there's about 5,000 people that work at Newark Airport for poverty wages. They work for companies like United Airlines, where the CEO makes $4,000 an hour, while the person cleaning his airplane makes $8.25 an hour. That's a big gap. So we're organizing the newer community to demand that companies that make, that generate over $20 billion in economic activity a year at Newark Airport do more for the community. Particularly a community that has an unemployment rate of 15% and about 25% of the population living at the poverty line. We can't allow for this to go on any longer. We have to make our voices heard. I have a petition that I'm going to ask people to sign to let United Airlines and all of the companies at the Port Authority and at the airport know that Newark is watching. Thank you very much. All power to the people. Come on, and that, then we're going to hear from Jimmy White and Sheila Montague. Hi, how are you doing? Ned Austin. Um, Newark Association and NJEN. I would not be here probably not for the Newark Rebellion. Um, and I realized that because my I was living in New York at the time. Um, I was very young. <laughs> my parent, my father worked at um, S. Klein's in wow. New York. And after the rebellion, they all of a sudden decided they needed some black management in, the, right. in Newark. Right. So That's they right. sent my father over yeah. to the S. Klein's yeah. in Newark, and he became, I believe, one of the, if not probably the first black manager that store had in, um, in Newark. So we came, moved from New York to Newark, not without incident, um, there were, after the, after the rebellion, some places that white people wanted to keep as their own. And um, it was evident when my parents tried to get an apartment in Ivy Hill, um, 250, Mount Vernon Place. And my mother went there looking for a place, and they were told there were no vacancies. She thought that was kind of strange. My mother's very in tune to certain things, and she was like, I don't believe that. So she had a friend of hers, um, our, was born in Germany, German, um, who came up with them next time um, to see if there were any availabilities yet. My mother went in first, and again, there were no availabilities. So she went down the hill. My um, um, Ursula came up and minutes later and all of a sudden there were all kinds of availabilities and we're exact same circumstances she, she said she had a wife, um, a husband, um, three, two children, etc. No problem. So she put a deposit down and of course that was a court case that went down and we eventually moved into the Ivy Hill um, apartments. Um, I'm saying that in that time period, I was about six years old, and my memory driving up Springfield Avenue, Clinton Avenue, seeing what looked like a war zone in that area. And if I think about the reasons, years later I went and did some research uh, into the Newark Rebellion and wrote a, a piece that was published in the Amsterdam News, and um, also it was a series that was published in the Amsterdam News and also in the Times of City News that was in Newark. Um, what I discovered was that much of what happened was a result of, and as has been said, we were not listened to at all. We were invisible. 
Um, the people in Newark were, were it was an oppressed state um, where you could not be heard or seen except for when you got the black media, you might see stories in the black media. But of course, it's now, Star Ledger didn't, play, didn't print anything uh, pertaining to black people particularly, and there was a Newark Evening News. Um, we were not, we were not seen, and so as a result, and there was this mafia type hold on everything that was going on in North. Okay, fast forward, future, and this is where I really want you to pay attention. Things have, the, the struggle continues, the luta continua, <laughs> because things have not changed. We have um, a governor who thinks he's still part of the Mafia and thinks that he controls the district, he controls the North. And we have a situation where we have no voice in what's going on in the education of our children. And so they, the government, the state feels they can do whatever they want regardless as to what the community says. The governor said, I don't care what the people of Newark think. I run this district. Okay, and that's what, he said. that's what he said. What's going on? Right now. How bad are we fighting back on this? Are we hearing this? Are we recognizing where we are right now? Okay, where we have big corporate people coming in and taking over our schools, closing our community schools. Our kids don't know where they're going in September. Shoot. Our teachers don't know where we're going in September. Okay, last four years. I've been going to work in September not knowing what grade I'm going to teach, not knowing what school I'm going to teach at, year after year, okay? Kids in the same situation, don't know where they're going to be. Some situations you have families where one student is going to go to one school, another student is going to go to another school in another area, and parents have no idea how they're going to get them from point A to point B, okay? This is madness right now. And then the HESPY. Commissioner Hesby went ahead and renewed Cammy's contract. Now, I heard he didn't really want to do it, but Christy runs this district, so he said that she's going to be renewed because he doesn't want it to make it look like she's fired, okay? Because she, he doesn't want to make it look like she's done a bad job. We know she's done a bad job. We know she should be gone, <laughs> you know? And, and we don't really care about you running for president. It's still won't look bad for the governor. Um, so here we are. We have to be prepared to fight. I have a petition going around as well. Um, it was for parents specifically. We're trying to get over a thousand signatures of parents um, to, to say no to the um, and call a moratorium on the one Newark plan, Christie plan, whatever you want to call it, no plan. Uh, we are asking um, parents to please sign this. And actually what I really need, I need some, some soldiers that are willing to go with me to various schools, um, summer schools, etc., um, before and after school and get signatures of parents. We want to get as many signatures as possible so that whether Governor Christie feels he can, needs to listen to us or not, we can slam it in his face and say this is absolute oppression to send it to everybody, not just to him, but across the, um, the legislature, the media, etc. And also, I need to mention one more thing. Um, the, North, the, the National Education Association, I just came back from a convention there, spoke for about 9,000 people, wow. and told them, and had the National Education Association agree to take on um, or speak out against um, state control, state district, um, state controlled districts across the country. Most of them black and brown people. This is just another way of taking away the, our voices. This is another form of enslavement. We can't allow it to happen. Okay, so um, the National Education Association is taking a stand against that, calling for a moratorium on um, state run districts, and um, ask, uh, calling that state run districts be returned back to local control. All right. If I ask, he's on the case. Now we're going to hear from Sheila, Ma Sheila Montague. Power to the people. I'm going to be brief. 
I just want to say, first of all, that this is a wonderful event. In fact, this is the most wonderful event that I believe that takes place in the city of North. Why? Because it's educational. And in order for our struggle to continue, we must be unified in that our education and our information is in sync with one another. As Annette just spoke about, education right now parallels the same rebellion that happened in 1967. Only thing different is many of us were not born at that time. And we have to navigate waters that have actually already been navigated but the only thing we have to do is just get the information to see how to go forward instead of reinventing the wheel again. Right. Annette also talked about our governor, who is close relatives with the mafia. This is a fact. The same situation that happened in 1967 is happening now. Chairman Ham spoke earlier about the uprising in different cities. Well, guess what? We have an uprising now with our education in Newark, in Camden, in Patterson, in New Jersey, and that's not coincidental. But again, to many of us who are just getting involved, without that necessary information, we wouldn't know that. So information is important. The fact that we don't get this information today, put it in our pocket and go our own separate individual ways is important. Each one has to teach one. I've been a teacher here in the city of Newark for 20 years, but I don't just teach in the classroom. I teach outside the classroom. Right, yeah, yeah. And a lot of things that go on, I don't always understand, so I go places. I ask questions and I agitate. Because it's needed. Not because I'm being contrary, but it's needed. We all need to be on the same page because this fight doesn't belong to one person. It belongs to all of us. And again, I just want to end up with saying what we're attempting to do right now is call a boycott for North Public Schools starting on the first day of school. People have told us that we can't win, but guess what? We've met people in Chicago who's coming here to meet with us who say that we have a chance to win. We are talking and meeting with people in Montclair who say we have a chance and we're going to win. And guess what? Worst case scenario, if we don't win, we fight. Some people may think that these people didn't win, but they didn't. The fact that we're here right now is the evidence. So again, I just want to just reiterate that this is a wonderful event. And I would be willing again to just say this is the greatest event, the most important event that takes place in this city. But we have to go to every event. We have to talk to our neighbors. We have to talk to people on the bus stop. We got to talk to people in the bodegas and the corner stores because people don't have the knowledge. And we can't move so simply if we don't have the knowledge. Thank you for having me today, Power to the People. Marquise Lewis, where's Jimmy White? All right. All right. Power to the people. Power to the people. Power to the people. Black power. Black power. Black power. Brothers and sisters, I give you greetings. On behalf of the North Board of Education, where I humbly served for the last six years, I served as the Vice President, now I am the President of Operations. Go ahead. Uh, I give you greetings on behalf of our Mayor, who was unfortunately couldn't be here today, as I serve as one of his aides. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. And, and I love this, I love that because this is the day the Lord has made. We're not here by accident. We're here by design. This is our destination for today. Well, just like Annette said, people in this city don't want to go back to 1967. But we almost did when it comes to our education system. Right. When it comes to our governor who thinks he's going to bully the city of North. No well, 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 last, last. Yeah, last year when I was here, Amir Baraka spoke, yeah. and he said, one of his words was, said, he said, I helped get the first black mayor, and he said, maybe I'll get us another black mayor. Yeah. And he was so right. He got us another black mayor, and it's his son, Raj J. Baraka. Yeah. And because we know that he come for a branch like Amir Baraka, 
We know that we can change this city. We know that we can move this city forward. We know we got our city back. You, you don't understand. When I walk through City Hall, it smells so refreshing. It smells like home again. I, I just want to take off my shoes and run through the hallways and just kiss the floor because it's ours again. But we have to do our part too. Ras Barak is the mayor, but he needs our help. He needs us to do our part. He needs us to get involved on our blocks, get involved in our neighborhoods, get involved in our organizations, get involved and come to the table. There's no reason now that we should be living in the condition we live in when we have a mayor who has his arms open to us and say, come in, be a, sit at the table. You don't got to go in the living room no more. You don't got to go in the field while we have a meeting. You got to be a part of the meeting. Amen? Amen. So I, I, I encourage everybody as we stand here today and we remember 1967 that we start being a part of the process of taking our city back because that's the only way that our children will live. That's the only way that our grandparents, our great grandparents will not roll over in that grave. When I look, when I go over to South Ninth Street and I see them take down the name of Dr. Martin Luther King from a school, I, I can feel him turning over his grave. I can feel our ancestors turning over our grave because a black elected official allowed this to happen. Black elected official allowed that to happen. In no way when Dr. King, one of his last stops, was right here in the city of North. We should allow that school to be closed down. God bless you. God bless. God bless North New Jersey. Jimmy White. Jimmy White, where you at? Come on. How y'all doing? How's everybody? I'm not just talking to the people over here in the crowd, I'm talking to the people over there in the parking lot, to the people waiting at the bus stop, to the people over there enjoying themselves in the store, across the street. I am very proud to be here um, in commemoration of the North Rebellion. This is my history. I'm a, I, I love my people. One thing, oh, I forgot one thing my second grade teacher always told me before I go into my presentation is to tell everybody who I am. My name is Jimmy White. I'm a I'm an entrepreneur. I've been a part of People's Organization for Progress for about five to six years now. Um, I'm very active in the community. And one thing about this program that I honor is that we get to let little black kids like him and all, our, and all the other black men, young black men especially, learn who they are. Because I play basketball down there at John F. Kennedy Recreational Center, all right, every week. And a lot of them who play ball, the kids practice by themselves, they say I play basketball because I don't want to be on the street, uh, out on the street, as if that's the only way that they can get off the street. As if books, as if books aren't available, as if books are irrelevant, as if they can't be anything else in the world. And my job as an organizer and a person who astute to my history and becoming more astute every day is that I tell them how viable they are as a people. And programs like this show the fight that you have that come from your ancestors down to you. As, as a black man, as a yes. black woman, and that you accept anything less but being great. Yes, yes. So, um, what I decided to do on my own, and also with commemoration is staying and being a part of this organization, is to do some things on my own. Because one thing that Razzle Rock, one of his slogans is that we, every, I'm, I'm mayor. I am mayor. Right. You mayor. But I always, but I felt I always been mayor in my city. I always felt wherever I was, wherever I go, I always been mayor. That everywhere I go, I have to be a positive force wherever I go. I have to be an example wherever I go. I have to put my best foot forward wherever I go. And I have to realize that there's value in this skin. That, at, that as an entrepreneur, this music, that art is within our blood. I'm glad Jaleesa shared her poem because that's a part of our heritage. Because we created pop music. We created rock and roll. We created blues. We created hip hop. We, we created the jazz. Every, every music genre you can think of, we created. We created the drum. We created civilization. We created writing. This, this is in our heritage. 
But we have little black, we have little young black men who don't know that. And I'm happy to be a part of part of an organization where I get the platform and a lot of listen to other people with the platform to be able to tell other black men and black women this message so they can carry such power with them. But when they go to school, they're able to know this power and question what's in school and question the, suppre the suppressive elements that lie on the television or, or lie when you're walking down the street. And, tell, and I'm also on this mic to tell them that Monero Bunami, Bunami, uh, everybody knows her. Um, she, she once said when she was an international youth organization for all the drug dealers is don't change the hustle, change the product. So what, what, so what my a message is to the brothers across the street who's hustling and anybody else over here is hustling, don't change, don't change your hustle, just change your product. Because one of the first things I'm doing when I open up my building is that I'm going to call a lot of y'all over there because I play basketball with a lot of y'all. It's to, to show you how to be entrepreneurs, to show you how to invest, to show you how to, 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 show you how to help manage your finances. And I'm still getting better at that. So when I when I get mine, I want you to get yours. And, and in order to stop the gentrification, we got to start owning what's in our city. We got to start looking at our fields as, as property that we can own. Not just be a part of and live under and rent under, but we can own that. To teach our babies from 9 years old to 18 years old by the time they get credit to be able to do something with it and open up a building, a vacant building, if we mess up our credit. Don't let, don't let your mistakes be their mistakes. But teach them and give them a direction that you can't say that if you can't properly teach that direction yourself to get them to turn them to different programs to put them in that direction to make it happen. So I don't want to take up too much time on the mic, but I like to thank People's Organization for Progress, everyone who came out, everyone who's listening to, to my message, and thank you very much. All right. My friend Carmine, come on, say your piece. <laughs> Brother Larry, I'm just glad to be back. I came here in 1972, and uh, must have been September, Larry. And I want to thank Larry because Larry keeps us going. Larry is the John the Baptist. Uh, Larry is the only believer beside, of course, our great poet, Amiri Baraka. His wonderful son is now taking over. But right now, it's downtown that we must look at. And from these heights, it's prudential. But when they go into their buildings, even public service, they pull down the blinds and they close all look at us and we become ghosts. We need an after school program at 3 o'clock for all our youngsters. John Dryden came down from Maine in 1875 and founded Prudential, where today that building, I believe, is a McDonald's, Larry. Yes, and in the basement there, he had the Prudential. And by the time he died, he was worth a billion dollars, you might say. But the corporation did very well. And now today, with public service next door, and when they charge us too much, I call them public theft, I want them to do right by Newark. They've done very well when a group of lawyers in 1901 put together all the gas companies, all the light companies. But right now, they don't see the light of helping our kids. We don't exist. And that's so darn wrong, because we cannot have today Nelson Mandela and the spirits of these lovely, wonderful people who sacrificed for us, and their blood must be respected. Because all Newark coming together on the same page, we can do wonders and show the United States what a national city can do. We're not international like New York or Los Angeles, but we have great businesses we have five major colleges and universities. At three o'clock, all our children should be in programs. There is no reason they shouldn't be, but that means Panasonic. That means Blue Cross and Blue Shield. That means all the legal offices that have files of income worth in the millions and billions support the city in which they earn their money. So Brother Carmine comes here because my mother and father were school teachers. I got to be a school teacher, but I didn't learn that much at Barringer or at Rutgers in Newark. But when I came to Springfield Avenue, I got to know the community. And the community were beautiful people. And right now, I see today the great tragedy. A woman was killed up here, and I believe uh, she was killed at Westside Park, a young woman recently. And she shouldn't have been killed and murdered. I think her name was Miss Bond. Okay, and, and Cheyenne Bond should be alive today 
except for the fact that that person who killed her never had the love of an after-school program, so they go up straight and tall, so that, for instance, we could see our young people working downtown with great jobs, working uptown, rebuilding every one of our wards, but not having a divided city. God bless you all. God bless these martyrs here. And Larry, God bless you. All right. Carmine, thank you. You hear what he said? We need an after-school program. I agree with that. For all the children, not just in some schools, because that's what we had in 67. And we had more in 67 than some of the kids got now. We had after-school program all year round. I learned karate, I learned martial arts in the gymnasium of South 17th Street School with my Boy Scout troop every night at South 17th Street School. The playground was open all year round. In the wintertime, we went inside and had activities in the school. In the summertime, we were outside. We had supervised recreation all summer long. They don't have that now. There's something wrong with that. The, the, the struggle in, in 70s, we had self-determination. We elected a black mayor, but we don't control our school system in 2014. That's a step backward. We lost some self-determination since 1970. So Carmine was right. I agree with you. We need all year round supervised recreation in all the schools for all the children, not just some children. Brad, you wanted to say something. Come on, say something, Brad. Brad Ringo, I remember people of days for progress. I've been going through a lot lately, but you got to realize, some people are not in our interest, but we got to stand up for our rights. In 1967, I, was, I knew people that didn't arrive. Even I was outside. And the man dashed the car, put, pointed the gun at my hand. And it wasn't for this lawyer and his daughter who was uh, who, who went to school with me, I could, wouldn't be here to talk to you now. But it's real. The reality is real. What it's meant for you to stand up for your rights and don't give up the fight. May God bless you. Thank you. Power to the people. So we're going to march to the police station and back. How many people going to march? I see Brother Enoch here from the Zulu Nation. Come on, give us some greetings, Brother Enoch. Maybe you can get them to march. I, I'm getting the feeling they don't want to march. <laughs> that, that's the feeling I'm getting. This Brother Enoch from the Zulu Nation. Give him a big hand. Come on, give him a hand. Peace, everybody. Bow to the people. Balante, mi gente. I represent for my my Latino brothers and sisters. I represent the city of North. I represent the Universal Zulu Nation. Lost Tribes chapter out here in North. We we we've worked uh, quite a few things with with um with POP over the years and the New Black Panther Party and NABC. It's, uh, it's been an experience. And to be here right now and stand amongst you, you know, some of you, I don't know some of your faces, but it's all right. To me, you're still my brother, you're still my sister, you know. To be here in this celebration, I'm honored, thank you. You know what I'm saying, to, to give me an opportunity to be out here. You know, this, this is the type of things that I ask for my people to push for, to, to uplift their people, to unite their people, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I'm always working with my black brothers and sisters to, to push hard, to, to unite our people and to fight for our kids. And, and I don't, you know, I don't get to see that much on the other side. So, you know, I'm hoping that this year and in the years to come, man, we're going to make some real big moves alongside with, with all of you, you know what I'm saying? And we're going we gonna to have a bigger celebration next year out here, and we're going to make it even stronger every year after that to celebrate this very moment in this very place right here where the re rebellion started. You know, um, I was just telling um, Brother Zaid that um, 
we acquired two lots over in, in the north and central ward, you know, with the adopt a lot program in north. And I think that's a, an important thing, you know, to look at because um, it's a sense of um, taking back, you know, and, and we're taking back these properties that have been abandoned and that have been um, filled with garbage and, and, and who, who knows what else, you know what I'm saying? And, and we, we're cleaning them out. We want to create gardens, create something positive. It, it, it's like something I said the other day. Um, I said, you see, out here they try to make up these things, these, these little parks to try to keep us happy, to try to shut us up, you know, and, and try to say, oh, look, we gave you this little park. But we gave all these other people out of town a stadium. And, 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 and we allowed them to come through and, and spend thousands of dollars, but we gave you this little park over here that we're not going to come by and clean for you. You know what I'm saying? You guys going to take care of it yourself. We see, they plant, I like to say it like this, they plant flower gardens. What we're going to do is plant trees, because the trees, the trees take longer to grow. It takes hard work to grow. We're going to put that hard work in. We're going to show the youth in the community how to put that hard work in. And, and, and our roots are going to grow deeper into the ground than the flower bed would, because these flowers will die by next season. And you got to replant them again. And that's what they're doing, replanting things to keep us quiet. Our people need to stand up to start planting these trees all over the place and, 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 and you know, and bring this, 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 this beautiful energy, this powerful, strong energy and be cultural about it, man. Go back to your roots, man. That, that's my thing. Go back to your roots. I may be Boricua and Ecuadorian, but I represent my indigenous Native American roots more than that. Because that's who I know who I am. That's what I represent. This is my land, you know? I teach that to my brothers and sisters, and we need to teach that to our kids. Just like I see, you know, all of these roots that grow deep, that unite us. Indigenous cultures throughout the world pay attention to them. Research, each and every one of them live somewhat the same, and they believe in somewhat the same things, and they have a humbleness to them. They give you that love and family, like, you know, affection. You know what I'm saying? In this modern day society, we don't, we don't, we don't live like that, you know? In this modern day society, we judge people just by the way they look, the color of their skin, self-racism and all that stuff. We need to get off of that, you know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, I got much love for all of you. This is a beautiful turnout. Uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I won't be able to march, but I think all of you should get up and march, you know what I'm saying? It's only to the police station and back, you know what I'm saying? You know, I've done many marches with this brother here and with, with many of the brothers and sisters here. And, and let me tell you, I got a torn ACL, I got a herniated disc, you know what I'm saying? And I'll be um, 350 pounds and I'll be on my feet moving. So there ain't no reason these young cats and these, these more healthier people shouldn't be walking. You know, be soldiers, man, be warriors. You know what I'm saying? Embrace that spirit, man, you know what I'm saying? Stand up strong. Power to the people. Power to the people. Palante, mi gente. She tried. <laughs> what good, what good? Well, I think I did an informal uh, survey. I don't think we're going to march today. <laughs> you want to do it? How many people going to march? I'm not going to march out there with three people now. Oh. We got six. All right. We'll march down and we'll march back. Let's do it now. We're not going to take any more speakers. We take one more speaker. We're not going to make it. We're going to put this band in the front. Go go right, right to the to the corner there, the flag, the flag bearers march behind this banner right here. Go ahead, go ahead, you gonna, you gonna march? Yeah, take, go right up to the tip there. We're gonna go single file. We're gonna walk down to the police station and back. Alright, DOP, let's go. I want to see both.
we are with you. Come on. We're not going to do any speaking at the police station. We're just going to walk down, walk back. I'll take one speaker. Whoever's stand behind, uh, watch, the, watch the equipment.